Thank you for joining us for um, the Global Action on Men's Health webinar, um, launching the report, Absent Minded, the Treatment of Men in Global Mental Health Policy, uh, was supported by the Novartis Company, um, AAA, I guess their, their unit was in there, and co-sponsored by the Georgetown Global Mental Health and Wellbeing Initiative. I'm Derek Griffith, I'm the Chair of Global Action on Men's Health, Director for the Center for Men's Health Equity and Professor of Health Management Policy at Georgetown. Um, so I'm delighted to welcome you to this particular event. Um, just by way of housekeeping, um, please sign in and share your name uh, using the chat, name and organization. Uh, we're gonna primarily use the Q&A to have questions, conversations, and so forth. Um, so please do share your thoughts and, and um, comments and questions uh, through that feature. And we do want this to be interactive. We have scheduled this so that we have time at the end for a lot of good engagement with both our um, presenters and as well as our discussants. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Global Action on Men's Health website and our YouTube channel and will be done um, by the top of the hour. So why are we doing this? So Global Action's main goal is to change the global health policy so that it better accounts for men and boys. And mental health, we know, is the second big policy area that we've looked at this year, actually, with the help of um, Drs. Leon and Colvin. Um, last year, we published Gone Missing, which looked at how men were treated in cancer policy, which, again, was led by our distinguished team. Um, later this year, we'll plan to, to publish two more reports one on primary care and one on um, sexual and reproductive health. But today we're looking at how men are treated in mental health policy at the global level. And again, with the generous funding of AAA, the Novartis sort of unit within there, we commissioned Drs. Natalie Leon and Professor Chris Colvin to look at this issue for us. Um, their report is published by Global Action on Men's Health today. Um, and Natalie and Chris will shortly be presenting their findings. and. The report is going to be available momentarily in the chat if it's not already. Um, their presentation will be followed by brief comments by um, two very distinguished and wonderful people, I must say, personally, um, Dr. Wisdom Powell and um, Dr. Uh, John Olaf. And then there'll be an open discussion for anyone to ask questions, make comments, and so forth. So I'm actually gonna make this really brief because um, I know um, our presenters are going to deal with why are we focusing on men's health in, uh, mental health, excuse me, in men's health um, in more depth. But clearly we know the rates of suicide, or rates of stigma related to mental health, um, alcohol use being particularly high, and just the misdiagnosis, underdiagnosis of men and boys in, um, in relation to mental health suggests that this is an area that really needs and warrants attention and that is not getting the commensurate attention with the what the epidemiology would suggest that we really need to deal with and do. And so in our discussion later, we don't want to just sort of limit the problems, but we also want to focus on next steps, what we can do from a policy standpoint, what we can do from an organizing standpoint, and what get your thoughts on what global action should be doing in this space, with whom and how we should do that. Uh, what should our advocacy strategy look like? Who should be our allies? Who can we connect with? And what opportunities do you see for change and for advancement? So we definitely want your engagement, advice, and support so that we can have the maximum impact. So just uh, briefly, I'm going to introduce, um, again, Drs. Leon and, and Colvin, and then turn it over to them to do their presentation. So we're going to be informal here, so with all the presenters and discussants, just so you're aware. Um, so Natalie is a health system and public health researcher with expertise in evidence synthesis to support evidence-informed decision-making to strengthen health systems for WHO guidelines and in South Africa. She works with the South African Medical Research Council and has honorary affiliations to Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. Chris is a professor in the Department of Public Health Sciences at the University of Virginia, right down the street. And he has honorary affiliations at the University of Cape Town and Brown University. He's an anthropologist and epidemiologist by training, and his research interest is on men, masculinity, and HIV, particularly in the South African context, with a focus on the development of community and health system-based uh, strategies for better engaging men in HIV prevention. And as I previously mentioned, Natalie and Chris are co-authors of the previous report, 
gone missing, the treatment of men in global cancer policy that we had the fortune of publishing last year. And so this is, we like them so much, we, we tried to do it again. And so here's their report, um, absent-minded. So let me turn it over to Natalie and Chris. Okay, thank you. Let's see. Okay, you all see the slides? Great, okay. So I'm gonna be taking um, you through the, just the problem kind of that we uh, addressed in the aim in the report. Uh, and then Natalie's gonna take you through our main findings uh, as well as methods. And I'll come back at the end uh, to reflect a little bit on what we should do about uh, the problem. Uh, what is the problem? So male gender inequity in mental health um, is our kind of main focus here. And Professor Griffith mentioned already a kind of a, a pretty well-recognized higher burden of uh, disease in terms of incidence and mortality and higher risk exposures across a range of mental health um, issues, including suicide risks, um, uh, risks in particular for male youth, um, uh, which many of these which track into adulthood, uh, under recognition of depression-related syndrome uh, sy symptoms, and in general, a lower health service utilization, which which tends to make the you know identification, prevention, and treatment of all these uh, worse. Um, sorry, I'm struggling with my zoom here. Okay, uh, these patterns are also persistent over time, and they intersect with other social determinants. Uh, and we do see some geographic variation. These are these are obviously very um, they're sensitive to cultural, economic, political contexts. Uh, but we've seen rapid kind of increases in many LMICs over the last uh, few years. Uh, the report uh, kind of so you know begins with an idea, an assumption that we need to increase policy attention to the unmet uh, health needs for men in these areas, and we take a gender equity approach uh, here, which is has been working well, I think, over you know decades uh, to address inequity in women's health. Uh, and we're now trying to extend the same lens to thinking about male health needs in this approach. And yeah, what we're trying to do in this report is to better understand the gaps in global mental health policy uh, so that we can understand kind of where we're starting from and to better inform advocacy for improving and making more equitable kind of policy and practice uh, towards male mental health uh, in, in all kind of areas, including prevention, treatment, and care. Uh, so our aim in the report, um, and to kind of sum it all up, is to review global and, re and regional uh, mental health policy related documents, uh, to assess the ways that men are currently considered in these documents. Uh, and you'll see that we, we have a fairly expansive view of what we mean by policy. Um, and we also, towards the end, uh, I'll come back and talk a little bit about the recommendations for policy advocacy, stra advocacy strategies. Uh, that global, national, and local advocates might use when trying to promote uh, better inclusion of men's needs around mental health. So I'll hand over to Natalie. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Our report draws on rapid systematic review methods, which require, require a systematic and a transparent approach to um, searching, identifying, and selecting documents which we detail in the method section of the report, including our approach to data extraction and data synthesis around the questions of to the, ex the extent to which gender was considered in these reports, and in particular, the extent to which um, male mental health needs were considered. So just briefly, an overview of the documents we identified uh, around 40 eligible documents and sampled down to 25 using the following criteria. We were looking at general mental health policies uh, for global inter-governmental uh, inter, um, um, organizations and non-governmental organizations. Uh, we wanted to also look at targeted mental health areas such as depression, suicide, alcohol, conduct disorder, including for adolescents. Um, we included some uh, 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 regional policies and uh, two Lancet Commission reports because these tend to influence policy as well. So uh, I will talk about how, if and how these reports engaged with gender through uh, representation of sex disaggregated data. 
the extent to which there was an awareness of the role of gender in mental health, and then more specifically where there were examples of engagement with uh, mental health of men in those key areas, including um, in male subgroups that we'll talk about later, and whether the reports talk about any kind of gender responsive interventions for uh, male mental health. Now, we know that sexist aggregated data is important for understanding and addressing gender distribution and inequities. And indeed, in half of these documents, uh, they did provide sexist aggregated data, but mostly this was um, in cursory references where data was quite limited in scope and depth. Depth, for example, there would be one or two ref uh, comparative narratives about uh, male and female mental health and or uh, one or more um, tables uh, for more in-depth data on issues like prevalence of main mental health uh, disorders, suicide rates, conduct disorder, alcohol use, and um, a few cases, patient admission rates. Five global reports did provide more sex disaggregated data. Two of these were mental health uh, atlases of WHO, which you would expect to have more uh, gender comparative data. Um, but there was also the World Mental Health Report and the Adolescent um, Health Report, uh, as well as uh, the World Federation of Mental Health Suicide Report that provided more in-depth data. Uh, but on the whole, there was an acknowledgement across these reports that we need more sex disaggregated data, including uh, um, yeah, on other social determinants. This is an example of the more, more detailed uh, provision of sexist aggregated data from the mental health uh, report, world uh, report, where you can see the key mental disorders are noted across ages uh, for males and females, and uh, one could easily assess then uh, where you have gender uh, disparities. With regards to um, how gender was seen, it was mainly seen as one, um, one amongst a range of social determinants of health and health disparities. Um, as evidence in this quote, quote where you uh, it says a wide range of factors influence a person's mental health, as well as their access to quality care and support. These include the person's age, sex, and they would list other determinants, and this would be a common reference, and um, it would usually not go further than that. Next. Uh, most reports acknowledge gen gender differentiated uh, gender differentiated mental health disparities, but only for women. Uh, usually in reference to adverse and disproportionate effects of gender inequality, as can be seen in this report, um, this quote that talks about poor mental health being both a cause and a consequence of gender inequality. And this was quite a common reference to gender inequality. Uh, with regards to mental health and men, several reports refer to men's mental health needs, but this was mostly cur cursory with limited detail and scope, often just a, one or two comparative um, uh, uh, sets of data. But a few reports did make more explicit mention of disparities in male mental health, um, with some a little bit of underlying explanation for, for why this might be. Uh, in particular, three WHO reports on adolescence and also the uh, World Federation report on suicide. Gender differentiated disparities for males were noted mainly for suicide mortality, for alcohol use and for conduct disorder. And several reports did make mention of mental health for male subgroups, such as people in prison and military, which of course is important because men are overrepresented in those groups. Um, with regards to depression, uh, the reports that did make uh, reference uh, note that there's a large uh, regional variation in depression prevalence for men, with Africa having the highest estimated prevalence, and that there's um, regional differentiation, uh, regional differences that are unclear at this stage. It's not clear if there are real geographical risks or different measurement tools. And this is, it's still unclear, as I mentioned. So depressive symptoms in men might also present differently. Um, for example, reports refer to externalizing spectrum compared to women, which would include behavioral disturbances, risk-taking, anger attacks, aggression, and substance abuse. And uh, one report at least uh, mentioned gender stereotyping may influence diagnosis and treatment for men and for women, as shown in this quote, where they note that stereotyping can lead to higher prescription rates of psychotropic drugs for women, and conversely, gender stereotyping in men can lead to the invisibility of mental distress. 
Um, men also experience emotional changes and stress as fathers in, per in the perinatal period, but paternal um, perinatal depression was not acknowledged um, in global mental health reports. So we looked at a WHO report on integrating perinatal services for women with other reproductive services, and they did make marginal references to male in males, in particular acknowledging that partners are also at risk for poor mental health that the positive mental health of the partner can be protective for the woman, and that um, one should have an inclusive approach to the mental health of the whole family, which include screening, treatment, and referral to support groups. The disproportionately high male suicide fertility rate for men was noted explicitly in some reports. In particular, the World Federation report provided the most gender differentiated burden of disease data for men and for women, including um, suicide rates that were disaggregated for gender, age, and country income level, and also how these variables intersect. There was an explicit focus in this report on gender differentiated risks amongst men, in particular, that psychosocial risks such as the loss or absence of an intimate partner increased the risk for older men, that there's increased vulnerability with impending legal action, recent imprisonment or upcoming release from custody, as well as with substance abuse, and that men were less likely to communicate their suicidal thoughts before attempting suicide compared to women and younger people. Um, alcohol disorders was noted, substance use disorder, especially alcohol as a common mental health condition, including reference to the higher burden amongst men. And in particular, the higher risk for male youth was noted in adolescent health reports. However, none of the reports made male specific recommendations to address the disproportionate burden of alcohol disorder amongst men. Um, the disproportionately high burden on boys of behavioral disorders, especially conduct disorder, was noted in global reports on adolescent health in particular, and that um, increased vulnerability of male youth was noted, including that these risks track into adulthood, as illustrated by the quote that says, mental health conditions in male adolescents put them at high risk of suicide, conduct disorder, alcohol and substance abuse and interpersonal violence, and that externalizing behaviors can cause significant issues in school, peer and family functioning that can persist into adulthood, increasing the risk of substance abuse. Um, several reports refer to mental health needs of people in prison and in the criminal justice system where males are overrepresented. One um, focused specifically on the human rights of people with mental health disorders. And a few of these reports refer to the mental health risks associated with people in, the milit in military combat and military veterans, with one mentioning child soldiers. Gender responsive intervention, several reports did uh, refer to the need for human rights approaches to gender and other disparities in mental health. Um, some uh, included calls for a gendered perspective in interventions using terms such as gender equal, gender inclusive, gender sensitive, but mostly as a guiding principle and without detailing these interventions. Where the disproportionate mental health burden on men was noted, there was, however, no explicit corresponding recommendations for gender responsive strategies that would address the mental health needs of boys and men, except here and there a few uh, references to promising interventions that had been tried. So in summary then, um, across mental health related global policy reports, there was little substantive evidence or attention paid to the gender differentiated burden of mental health disease for men. Although none of the reports focused explicitly on addressing health inequities, most actually acknowledged um, gender inequities in women's mental health in relation to the increased vulnerability due to gender inequality. Reports on suicide and, um, and on adolescent health provided more detailed information on the mental health needs of boys and men. Um, and reports that applied an even-handed approach to detailing gender differentiated, gender differentiated disease distribution were in effect then able to give more explicit um, uh, ever, uh, um, identification of mental health needs of men alongside that of women. 
So in my view, there were missed opportunities for gender responsive recommendations to address the disproportionate burden on men's mental health, especially in those reports that went a step further and actually acknowledged male health disparities. And I will now hand over to Chris to look at um, policy recommendations. So in terms of thinking about what we can do about the problem, uh, we've organized our thinking using this um, what's uh, known as the three, st three streams model of policy windows of opportunity from Kingdom. Uh, and it's a pretty basic model that helps you just to name uh, different aspects of your advocacy strategy. The, the problem stream refers to how well the problem is understood, both from a kind of academic research point of view, but also from the point of view of public awareness of the problem. The policy stream refers to the degree to which policy options are well defined and understood and, and kind of available for consideration. And the political stream refers to the broader context, the broader political context in which decisions are made. And these can either open up or close down possibilities um, for policy change. So I'm gonna talk you through some ideas in each of these streams. Uh, I'm not gonna read through all of the tables, but I will talk in particular about the first column of each one. So in the problem stream, in order to ensure that the, the, the problems are well understood and well documented, uh, we need to do several things. We need to build a robust, um, a nuanced and a diverse research evidence base around the problem which covers kind of the wide spectrum of mental health issues and considers men and all their diversity. We need to also then work to make this evidence base accessible uh, because if it's not accessible, it will have been wasted effort. Um, and a lot of the ways of making evidence accessible are, are not specific to men's mental health. Uh, it's just about kind of knowledge translation kind of efforts. And finally, we can leverage uh, interest in existing areas of concern. So tap into, for example, issues on the global agenda around NCDs and mental health or the post COVID response uh, in particular around mental health of youth. Um, so these are ways to, to try to increase the visibility of the problem in the kind of policy space. The policy stream, again, we need to build evidence around uh, promising interventions. Uh, that again include a variety of, of men's experiences and needs and settings. And we should consolidate and build from emerging best practices for men and mental health. We found uh, there are some useful uh, policy statements, practices that address men's mental health uh, in some uh, pretty thoughtful ways. And we need to kind of amplify and, and, and kind of disseminate these and develop best practices around healthcare professional training, healthcare and social care, so uh, professional training, uh, developing male-friendly initiatives, um, and promoting kind of strength-based approaches to men's mental health. Um, uh, and then for, further in the policy stream, uh, we wanna, we're kind of suggesting leveraging the growing number of national and global men's health policies and advocates uh, to develop uh, kind of integrated strategies. And this is really about working outside of uh, um, silos um, so that people working in mental health are also working with people in cancer and primary care and in other areas. Uh, and then leverage interest in current promising areas of intervention and partnerships. Um, so in both of these areas where we're uh, pointing to the need to work collaboratively across a range of different uh, kind of levels and silos. Um, and finally, in the policy stream, uh, a similar idea, leverage parallel policy development for women or for men and other health issues. So aligning more with uh, closely parallel efforts uh, around women's mental health uh, and perinatal depression, for example, or prevention of gender-based violence. These are areas where um, there's obvious synergies and, and important ways that we need to align our work. Uh, and then aligning with the kind of broader global uh, health uh, initiatives around uh, equity. So the SDG3 um, or the interest in uh, people-centered health services for strengthening health systems. And then finally, the kind of bigger, uh, bigger picture, longer term um, goal is to make sure that we're building long-term coalitions and networks with individuals and institutions working on these issues. 
uh, one of the ideas of the windows of opportunity model is that when a window of opportunity opens up for whatever reason, the people interested in that policy question need to be ready to, to move. And, and often it's too late once the window's opened to start forming those, those connections and coalitions. And so part of, part of what uh, hopefully this report also is contributing to is to building that conversation and helping to lay the foundation for those coalitions that in a year or two or five years time can take advantage of uh, the windows as they open. Right. And I think with that, we will just acknowledge uh, Peter and uh, Baker for his support and the GAMH executive and the peer reviewers, and we'll go on. I think we've got questions and comments coming up, but we've first got discussions. So I'm gonna hand back over to uh, Professor Griffith. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for that wonderful presentation. Um, let me quickly go ahead and introduce our discussants. Um, oops. Fair screen would be helpful. Okay. Um, So we have two wonderful discussants today and we're gonna get their brief responses. Um, professor Wisdom Powell Wisdom is a tenured professor and nationally recognized expert and thought leader on racial trauma, healing and health equity. Currently, she also serves as a chief purpose officer at Headspace. She serves as an equity brand strategist for corporations, nonprofits and academic institutions been a routine um, media contributor to ABC News Live and was recently named one of the top 25 essential voices on Black mental health. Wisdom serves on and leads several national advisory councils on racial health disparities in boys and men, uh, including one from the American Psychological Association that I had the pleasure of serving with her on um, some years ago. And in recognition of her public service to boys and men, she received the American Psychological Association Division 51's Distinguished Professional Service Award. In addition, we have Professor John Olaf. And John is a professor and Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Men's Health Promotion at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. He leads the UBC Men's Health uh, Research Program. Uh, his work focuses mostly on masculinities as it influences men's health behaviors and illness management and its impact on partners, families, and overall uh, life quality. Findings drawn from his research offer guidance. Findings drawn from his research offer guidance to clinicians and researchers to advance men's health promotion in the areas of psychosocial prostate cancer care, uh, smoking cessation, and male suicide prevention. John is also a member of Global Action on Men's Health. So with that, let me turn it over to my good friend, Dr. Powell. Thank you so much, Dr. Griffith. And thank you to all of my colleagues who are here in the room today and all of you for joining us from around the world. I wanna thank you all for the opportunity to provide some initial remarks about this timely and what I feel fiercely urgent um, report. What is a fiercely urgent report? I wanna ground you know, my reflections today in a popular thesis that's been offered by Kwame Apaya. And those of you who know this thesis know that Apaya argues that future generations will judge us and condemn us on our failure to address certain pressing social issues and problems, particularly those that are related to the protection of the well being of all individuals. And what Kwame Apaya's thesis argues is that future generations will condemn us for our inability to apply what we know to issues that have well documented evidence and for which we have at times. Um, you know, sort of demonstrated strategic ignorance around. And so as this report robustly lays out, there are a number of, of wide ranging um, documentation or evidence surrounding the issues uh, related to men's health disparities. And we've known this evidence for a while, we've seen it unfold, and yet we have yet to really rise up to meet this challenge with the highest intentions for resolving it. I believe that future generations may also condemn us for perpetuating some of the harmful gender norms and stereotypes that have been lifted up in the report that discourage men from seeking help and expressing their emotions openly. And by failing to design these robust men's mental health policies that we're all here to talk about, we know that we're neglecting a mental health 
uh, issue and well and well-being of a significant portion of our global population, thereby perpetuating a cycle of suffering and hindering progress towards a more inclusive and compassionate society. To avoid this condemnation, as this report lifts up, it's crucial that we prioritize and invest in comprehensive policies that address men's mental health needs. What this report does and, and really lays out is the robust evidence around the inequities in men's health outcomes that are preventable. When it comes to men's mental health, we know that there is a prevailing stigma and lack of support that often prevents men from seeking help and accessing appropriate resources. And the failure to prioritize and design these comprehensive policies concerns um, actually reflect the societal negligence towards the emotional well-being of men, which is what Apaya um, warns us against. When we design robust mental health policies um, to address and challenge these harmful stereotypes, we are, in fact, creating safer, braver spaces for men to open up and discuss their emotions and seek help when needed. This includes efforts that we might put into play as lifted up in the report to destigmatize mental health issues, to promote open and honest conversations about emotions, to provide accessible and tailored, customized mental health services and foster a supportive environment for men to seek help without fear and judgment. What this report also reminds us is that we have to also consider intersectionality when applying um, our, these policy lenses or policy solutions to men's health around the world because men occupy different caste positions. There are some men who are occupy stat statuses that render them more vulnerable so to socioeconomic threats, and they may need additional policy prioritization, and we have to keep that front of mind. What was most encouraging for me about this report was were the following call-outs. One, moving from gender-specific to gender-transformative policies, so important addressing the architecture of our discontents around men's mental health and not solely the occupants. We focused a lot of our efforts on fixing men. But what I've understood most in my 20 years in this space is that when they're all the fish in the water are dying, it's probably not the fish. It's probably something in the water. And what this policy report calls our attention to is looking at the gender differentiated effects and the ways we deliver care, the way we prioritize mental health, um, among men and policies and looking at the water. Grounding our policy arguments in different kinds of narratives um, that are moving us away from the social construction, I mean, moving us away from the biologically driven arguments that have limited our radical ima imaginations towards one that actually ground us in the social constructions of gender are important as we think about the policy landscape um, as we move forward. And I want to end my remarks by focusing on two particular lenses that I think are going to be relevant if we're going to design global policy that, policies that address men's mental health disparities. The first is the need to take a human rights lens. And the second is focusing in on the impacts, what, not just what we lose in terms of individual health outcomes, but what we lose as societies when we fail to focus in on men's mental health and focusing in specifically on how our ne negligence impacts global sustainability, peace, justice, and secure institutions. By applying a human rights lens to mental, men's mental health challenges, policy design can ensure equal access to services, address discrimination, empower men without um, minimizing women, foster accountability, and really thoughtfully consider intersectionality. When we address men's mental health through a peace, conflict resolution, and global stability lens, we also get to prioritize men, men's mental health policies because it affects all of us. It broadens the aperture through which we view the problem and therefore minimizes our reliance on a zero-sum proposition that, that often limits the policy solutions that we design. When we prioritize men's mental health through a human rights lens, through a conflict resolution and global stabilization lens, we're also able to reimagine how we can bring resources and supports to break the cycle of violence, improve decision-making processes, facilitate effective peace-building efforts, and mitigate humanitarian crises, and challenge the harmful gender, uh, gender stereotypes that perpetuate global conflicts. Because ultimately, investing in men's mental health can contribute to a more peaceful and secure global landscape. It is those lenses that I think that we need to bring to bear on the challenge of developing more robust policies if we're gonna get shared accountability, 
if we're going to get global nations, institutions, and leaders to buy in, and if we're going to really reposition this challenge as one that affects all of us and not just the men and boys who find themselves at the end of the global inequities that we are drawing attention to in this conversation. Thank you for the opportunity to provide these remarks. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Ovis. Um, just a shot, just to say that was that was great, um, Dr. Powell. So good. Um, I'll throw in a couple of ideas. Um, I, I read the report, really enjoyed it. Thanks so much for your presentation. It's affirmation of 20 years of empirical work for me, um, <laughs> you know, in and around the, the spaces of men's depression and suicidality. Just a couple of thoughts, you know, as I was reading through and when I hear you today and the conversation, um, I'm struck by how siloed we get <laughs> in terms of policy, empirical work, um, this notion of KT, knowledge translation, and this conflation with implementation science, which is a, an angle I think we should thoughtfully consider. So I'll just shout out a few random thoughts here that, that might help us continue the conversation, so to speak. I've long been a believer that there's a cul-de-sac in sex differences that leads us to this point where when we're on a binary just saying, well, men and women are different, so they need different things. And, and there's lots of evidence in the report that the conversation stops there. If you think about it, 90% of the feedstocks of empirical data that are reported really describe the problems. And one way of describing the problems is to truncate on sex differences. I'm not saying it's not important. It often sets you up to be able to think about gender gender specificities um, and gender transformation has been as has been mentioned. And this movement to being gender responsive, which I think is is something that we should thoughtfully consider. The angle in has typically been around the social determinants of health, which has given us this opportunity to thoughtfully consider inequities um, and so and then how to address them. And I think that is an angle in, as well as, um, as Dr. Power suggests, gender relations. Like it's never really about guys. It is as an intervention point, but it's really about benefit for all. So that humanness, that, that importance around making a difference to everybody, but your intervention point is with guys. Again, you know, there's this belabouring in uh, policy reports that, that you've reviewed around outcomes. So, you know, we talk about depression, <laughs> we talk about, you know, suicide, but underneath those things, we know that there's lots of social contexts. And I'm struck by being in a post, what someone referred to the other day as a post Me Too era and a post COVID time. Um, and I think about, you know, the finite resources that are there and then this notion and this utopia of wanting to be upstream to sort of prevent some of these outcomes and start to reduce what could be expressed as disparities if we wanted to in a comparative way, or just be expressed as long-term challenges in men's and boys' health. So just to say, I think it's, it's a, such an interesting time to ask to do more and to do it in different ways um, and to acknowledge the diversity, equity, and inc inclusion that are must-go-tos you know, uh, now and forevermore. Um, I just, uh, just to go back to a couple of, a couple of things, just want to say um, this notion around implementation science, I, I'm struck by there is a, is a world of gender work. And I appreciate that you've reviewed these policies that give a nod to the sex differences, but don't really give a nod to a burgeoning field that's actually well established over the last 15, 20 years. One of the places where those, you know, that empirical work gets picked up, and this is this is sort of kind of reflective of, of academe and the system, is that you know, scoping reviews and systematic reviews are the points that get picked up by people new to the field and coming into the field as well as established folks. And so it is a way of KT. But the implementation science for the implications of those findings where we continue to say, here's the issue, here's the problem. We want to build these, you know, these lovely interventions, uh, programs that are tailored, uh, that meet the needs, that satiate the equity needs of people uh, and different subgroups of guys, especially. Really important. But it's at a time when public health um, and many other forms of healthcare 
are quite barren and quite stretched in terms of everything, you know, the bankruptcy of COVID, um, et cetera. Um, so this might be a little bit provocative, but I'll finish on this. But just to say, I do think that we need to think about the commercial determinants of health. Um, you know, <laughs> there's been a lot of people made a lot of money out of uh, out of COVID-19. Um, you know, suppliers of health, health products along the way and, and the like. And I'm not suggesting that, you know, we get into that commerce side of things. But for someone who for the last 20 years has written grants to get up 15% of the time and missed 85% of the time with good ideas, um, I do wonder whether there's a way of actually thinking about a commercial, a way of working with commercial determinants of health that might help us you know, sustain and scale some of these great interventions that are literally tumbleweeds that die with the grant that built them, um, you know, in the traditional funding model. So I just I just shout that out in terms of interventions because I think it has a lot of implications for policy as well about how we think about sustaining these things because I see lots of good ideas that fall by the wayside purely not because they're not effectual, but we, that we don't have the uh, maybe the budget to get the empirical grunt that we need to drive these things into a into a, a long term uh, long term option. Again, just a shout out of thanks for you know everyone um, uh, including me on the on the discussions and, uh, uh, and and huge work and really appreciate the effort that's gone into this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both. Thank you, John, for that those wonderful comments. Um, I think it fits nicely with some of the first questions that we have. So um, let me just jump into uh, one of the first ones, which was, and I lost it, um, from Mark Brooks. He says, in terms of, um, how do you create windows of opportunity when the political stream is not interested? Yeah, so, so the politics, the, I guess just a couple of things to say. The the political stream, uh, the politics stream, is the in this model way of thinking about it, the the least easy to change. It's, it's the area that we have the least control over, right? It's the kind of broader context. Um, I do think, though, I'm I'm, in, I'm inferring from your question that um, you're saying that the the people who are active in politics are not interested in this problem, not aware of this problem. Um, and, and I think that's true. And we need to kind of build up that a, a kind of awareness and urgency. But that's really in the problem stream, right? Because it's it's a recognition of what the problem is and a, and a motivation to engage with the problem. And there are times when there's opportunities to, you know, something happens um, and you, it's an opportunity to highlight the problem. The politics stream is more about what is going on in the institutions and processes of decision-making that represent a, an entry point, a leverage point, a, a place where we can kind of make a difference and, and not directly related to the problem per se. And, and one of the, the kind of examples of this that comes to me, it's, it's actually not typical politics, but um, the WHO's kind of recent uh, embrace of sex disaggregated data in its reporting requirements which was a long time coming and took a lot of advocacy to get them to be able to require that as a, as a kind of a, a, a routine part of their uh, knowledge production. That potentially is a really important difference, a really important development in the politics stream, because what it means is that decision-making is now done with a, a new set of data, right? Or, or newly kind of a refined set of, of information. Uh, which enables particular problems to come to the surface and, and be dealt with. Um, it may be a policy cycle. Like we know that every five years, uh, Global Fund is going to um, decide where to strategize and put its money for the next five years. And if we can get people into those committees that are, that are uh, developing those strategies um, and, and priority areas, then that's going to be potentially really important. Not so much to advocate directly for your particular niche issue, but for getting you know uh, the kind of broad area around men's health needs on the table. And if you can get that into the strategic plan, then you've got something that you can leverage off of you know for years. So the politics stream is is 
is the hardest to change and it's also the most abstract in a way, but it can be really important because it's about that architecture of decision making um, that that can really uh, open up or close down possibilities. Yeah, thank you. And what I'm also hearing is how intertwined, that even though we present them for simplicity's sake mm -hmm. as really three separate streams, that they're very much intertwined and interconnected. Um, Wisdom, John, do you have um, thoughts, reactions? I think both of your comments speak to this, the interconnection of these three streams and how they're a bit, the, the boundaries are a bit more permeable than we would sort of think of, oh, we only can intervene in one. I think, Chris, your comments speak to that as well. So Wisdom, John, any particular thoughts? And just a say, there is clearly not a cross-sectional cross moment. You know, this is a long game. Um, you know, given the given change of governments and and different political appetites at, at different points in history, I just I just remind us of post COVID, post Me Too, in a, in a period of, of that, then then you know the satiation around perhaps you know gender relations would be would and and, and in a proactive way of getting upstream, I think might be might be an angle in uh, as a rookie to to you know policy piece. So I'll add this, and I think it relates to a question, and I'll spin this into the response to Dominic's question in the chat that was directed to me around a rights-based approach, because I think there's some uh, synergy between the response I'm going to provide here and the one I would to that question. What I would say is that I think we have a narrative, we have both a gatekeeper and a narrative uh, change challenge here. I think one of the central blockages in a policymaking process is the period in which policy becomes that period between when we discover a problem and when a policy gets on the actual agenda. The agenda setting stage um, in the policymaking process is one of the most nebulous, but perhaps the most important because it sets up the framework through which we view the problem and therefore the potential matrix of solutions. And the way that we've addressed men's health um, issues in our policy spaces is we've started with the problem. We've problematized boys and men in a way, and I've, uh, Dr. Griffith has heard, has heard me say this many times, that we've treated men and boys as if solely their problems to be solved and not potential wonders to behold in terms of their potential contributions to a more sustainable, peace, you know, um, cemented society or global world. And so when we design policies with the problem in front of us, rather than the potential, then we always end up with these really fractured solutions that really don't take into account the whole human being. So I think first we have to disrupt the single stories in the policy space that we tell about men and boys so that we design policies that are more positively valenced, which then opens up a whole different set of possible solutions. The second thing is more provocative in that we have to think about what does it say about our world that men in general um, hold more political and economic power? They're more likely to be at the helms of the policy tables that we're talking about and to be more in front of or in charge of making policies for societies. What does it say about our world that even with that, disproportionate representation among men in those policy spaces that we still find ourselves at this critical precipice. I think it says that we that men themselves need a baptism and I'm you know come from a Pentecostal church so just if I start getting you know, evangelical uh, blame blame my parents but what I would say is that I think that we need really to shift um, the ideological framing in the policy rooms themselves it this speaks to volumes to the need for re-education of our policy leaders and clear advocacy that is built from a different lens that's positively valenced and grounded in this idea that what we're fighting for isn't us or them. It isn't, you know, men up, women down. It isn't, you know, um, either or. It is all of us. It's a human rights lens. And when you do that, it broadens the aperture. The other thing that is really important from a human rights perspective, and also as we try to figure out how do we swim in the streams, how do we shift the streams, we have to really understand that what we are building out here is about protecting the peace and stability of nations. If you look around our world at the global conflicts that we find ourselves in right now, what is at the root of that? Isn't men behaving badly? It's the social construction of masculinities that teach men that to 
rule and govern, to have power, they have to exert a particular type of strong, stoic, unflappable masculinity. And that to me is the the pure elephant in the policy spaces in the rooms that we occupy. Until we dismantle that ideological barrier, we're going to find ourselves at the same rivers twice, swimming in the same streams, going in the wrong directions, and never ending up with the kinds of solutions that we know will bring about the health, the stability, and ultimately the radical healing of men and boys around our globe. And we need that. All of us need that, not just men and boys. Women and girls suffer when men are unwell. When men fail to address their interior lives, who gets the in, the receiving end of that? Women, girls, communities, families, systems, and societies. Until we embrace this challenge as all of our own, we're going to still have these incomplete solutions that lead us, you know, down the similar roads that we've been before. So again, forgive the the evangelical nature of my my response, but I'm passionate about creating a world where we can all heal, grow, and thrive, and that starts with recognizing that our men and boys are not dispensable in our world. Um, and I'll thank leave you. it there. Yeah, thank you. No apologies needed. Um, I want to actually see if we can get um, Mark Brooks, who I believe works with the UK government. Um, Mark, I know you asked a question. You're a policy advisor on, on male inclusion in the UK. You could just have, you know, we just wanted to sort of get your thoughts, particularly given uh, your role and how you're doing this work and how you see this within uh, a government sort of perspective. Sorry to put you on the spot, but um, we're excited that you're here. Well, 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 thank you. Thank you, Derek. And um, I've, uh, I'm just wearing a T-shirt, actually, so I'm being really scruffy, so I'm not going on <laughs> But, no um, um, I mean, I mean, the key thing, and there's a number of UK colleagues on um, on on this seminar as well. And I think the the way that we've started to get traction in the UK because um, we're going to have a men's health ambassador, um, and also we we've got some task and finish groups which are sponsored by the UK government. A number of colleagues on the call are on this webinar are actually on there as well. And I think what we've done is that we've produced policy reports um, in terms of actually speaking to the polit political stream in a political language. So we've built um, from all the work from colleagues here, and I know um, certainly, um, certainly uh, from the speakers as well, we've used those to produce policy reports and research going and using going down the problem stream and then the policy stream so we've said this is the problem these are the policies this is why you as the political stream need to take heed of them but we've written them in the way that government will understand how politicians will understand and also how civil servants and other health bodies so that's how we've done them. We we haven't looked at it from we need to produce academic papers, although they've been the basis of our work. Um, we've translated that into the language that the political stream will understand. And also we've continually been at them and positioning this as a, a DEI um, issue, a human rights issue, and also from an equality perspective, i.e., um, you know, we, we can't have a society where um, the focus on health equality and inequality is only on women and not on women and men. And that's really helped as well. Whatever will come of the general election, we've got a big general election this year. Um, um, we are confident that there will be men's health featured in both the Labour Party's manifesto um, and also the Conservative Party manifesto, which will be a big win because that will mean that public policy will at last fully acknowledge that men's health is a policy area in that whole of the health system, if that helps. Yes, it does tremendously. And hopefully <clears throat> we can learn some lessons as we have a big election coming up this year here in the States as well. <laughs> So in the interest of time, we're closing in about five minutes. I'm going to ask for quick responses or just final <laughs> comments from um, Chris and Natalie, from John and from Wisdom, um, and just close this out. But yes, Mark, thank you so much for those uh, thoughtful comments and for the, sharing the work that you're doing. 
So Chris and Natalie, or Natalie and Chris. Thank you um, to the contributors. Um, um, I think uh, linking to the last the person, Mark speaking and other people mentioning the politics stream, I think there is some uh, forward movement uh, as um, reflected in several countries, both high income and LMICs now having male mental health strategies. And I think it would be worth looking more closely at how those policies came about and what we can learn from the actual best practice of a male, a male policy, uh, male health policy development. Yeah. And I think I just wanted to reiterate, I think um, some of the framing that in particular wisdom was coming up around, um, well, the importance of framing, the importance of, of, of how, uh, this issue gets talked about and, and what framings are compelling, which ones help people open up their imagination, their empathy to, to kind of understanding the, these problems differently. I think anyone who's worked in this area for a while will recognize very quickly how powerful this kind of um, victim perpetrator framing is. Right, that 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 men are the ones who who who's perpetrate, but also men are the ones who have agency, and women are there to be victims, right? And and that's really hard to to break out of that, and it's quite a risky strategy to say, to to only say, you know, um, yes, women, but also men. We also need to look at men. You know, men also have problems. It, it's I think it's it's much more powerful if we can try to shift the conversation to talking about the problem in the terms of how, what is it about the world we live in that produces these patterns? What is it about how we have organized our lives collectively that men are acting and suffering and, and feeling and believing and, and doing this way and, and men and women, you know, are, are also having an experience in the world and what do we need to change about our world so that things, those things different, uh, those things play out differently. Um, and those, those, that reframing work is hard and it's slow, but I think it's quite important um, to, to make sure we, we're kind of keeping in mind. Thank you. Uh, John, then I'm gonna, Wisdom, you're gonna close us out. So John first, please. Yeah, just to say, thank you for the opportunity to, to read this report and have this conversation. Um, really, really helpful. Learned a lot today, it's been really good. Um, just to say, um, just as a closing point, just say, um, you know, we often talk about being gender responsive. That's kind of the catchphrase that's going around with WHO at the moment. So it kind of moves from trans gender transformation, you know, gender sensitive. And I think this gender responsive piece is interesting. Um, I'm, I've long been tired of hegemonic masculinity, traditional masculine norms as somehow the baseline by which we determine people's behaviours. When I talk to young blokes these days, um, they don't really resonate with some of the traditional ways. <laughs> And if we're going to be gender responsive, I think it's on us all to present, you know, some of the some of the positives and some of the shifts that are there um, in thinking about how we do the work of health and in particular boys and men's health. Um, we just got through, you know, interviewing a bunch of guys about what is an equitable intimate partner relationship, you know, 19 to 44 years of age. And honestly, the insights are just so boring and, and really, really interesting. And I don't think we would have got it if we spoke to previous generations of guys. I mean, there's shifts. And I just I just encourage us to be responsive to what we have and these generations coming through and to maybe step off this traditional masculinity, this hegemonic masculinity, as, as somehow, you know, the compass, the map, because um, I think people increasingly are operating outside of this. Thank you. I mean, that was so beautiful, John. I, I mean, what I will just add on to that, I think you really articulated it, is that we have to tell whole stories. I mean, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie warns us of the dangers of a single story. And the single story that we've been telling about men and boys is plaguing us so um, greatly and inhibiting our capacity to really design robust and inclusive strategies that truly meet men today, as John has said, where they are. And narrative change and disruption isn't going to come just from the public sector. It isn't going to come just from the, the governmental sector. I would highly encourage more private sector, uh, public-private 
partnership investments and narrative change. They have broader capabilities, broader range, more resources to shift narratives. Why aren't we telling the stories that we need to tell that will that will generate the policies we're talking about in this room? And my time in the in the Obama administration and serving with Secretary Leon Panetta, what was really um, interesting to me in trying to do this work in military culture was how many decisions were made around policy tables that were based on storytelling and not data and not facts and figures and p-values and coefficients. Policymakers don't think in those terms. So we have to get better at speaking to them in the language that they understand, framing the stories, giving them easy to digest materials so that they can articulate this out in the world and working with our private sector leaders and industry um, CEOs to promote better messaging. In everything we consume in the world, there's an opportunity to tell a different story about men and boys. And I think we should leverage those um, if we really truly want to move the needle on this challenge. Thank you to all the presenters for allowing me to be here. Thank you for this robust and important report. And thank all of you for investing in this mission and movement. We need it desperately. Thank you all for this wonderful uh, presentation, conversation, so forth. Let me, in the interest of time, just turn it over to Peter Baker, the Director of Global Action Women's Health, to close this out. Well, thank you very much, Derek, and thank you to all the speakers. That was uh, a fantastic uh, webinar and it exceeded all our expectations, I think, in terms of the quality of the presentations and uh, some great questions too. So thank you to everybody who, who spoke, who, who presented, and thank you to everybody who joined the call, uh, who, who was here today. Um, we will be sharing, uh, we've recorded this webinar, we'll be sharing the uh, video uh, as soon as we can. Uh, with everybody who registered and uh, more widely through our website. Um, I'm certainly going to look at it again. I mean, there's so much to learn from this. I, and I, I think I, I'll look at it two or three times to make sure I've understood and you know seen, seen the kind of full potential of everything that's been said today. What I would like to do very quickly, and I know I've got about 30 seconds, is to uh, mention uh, our website, um, gam.org. I'd encourage everybody who doesn't hasn't been there before to, to visit, to uh, look at our Twitter feed, to keep up to date with what we're doing. And if, you, if you're not already a member of Global Action and you've enjoyed what you've heard today, please do think about joining us. We, we'd love to have everybody who's involved in men's health anywhere in the world working with us as part of our network. So please check us out, check how you can join Global Action. Um, and uh, you know, I look forward to uh, meeting you and seeing you and hopefully uh, having you on board as a, as a member. So I'll end there and um, thank, I'd like to thank everybody again and just back to you, Derek, for a final goodbye. Yeah, just thank you all. It was wonderful. And yes, please consider joining and joining us in this fight. So thank you so much. Be well, everyone.